Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us uh, for this event on Iran's regional uh, network and the crisis in the Middle East. This is part of our ongoing programming here, programming here at the Brookings Institution following the extremely troubling and very bloody events in the Middle East in the past four and a half months. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by a truly excellent panel of uh, experts. Uh, we have one guest, and I will start by introducing him and three of our own scholars to discuss Iran's network and to the degree to which it is a network, or rather a group of disparate but very important actors. So first, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Renat Mansour. He's a senior research fellow and project director of the Iraq Initiative at Chatham House, a very famous think tank in London. He's also a senior research fellow at the American University of Iraq in Sulaymaniyah, and he was previously a lecturer at LSC in London. Uh, Renat, thank you very much for joining us. I'll note also that he has a new paper that can be found at Chatham House, uh, the Chatham House website called Networks of Power, relating directly to our issue today. Allison Miner is a visiting fellow in the Center for Sustainable Development here at Brookings. Most recently, Allison served as Deputy Special Envoy for Yemen at the U.S. Department of State. Of course, she's speaking here on completely on her own, um, in her own capacity and not for the U.S. government in any way. In her role at the State Department, her recent role, she worked closely with the U.N. Special Envoy uh, to secure the longest truce since, Yemen, since the Yemen conflict began, a truce that still holds. It paving the way also for a dialogue on, on a comprehensive peace process. Uh, previously, she was also at the NSC, the National Security Council, and USAID and the US Development Finance Corporation. And we're truly delighted to have Allison with us here this year. Please see her writing also with us and especially on uh, the crisis in the Red Sea uh, at the Brookings website. My colleague Jeffrey Feltman joined us. He's the John C. Whitehead Visiting Fellow in International Diplomacy in the Foreign Policy Program here at Brookings. Uh, Jeff has had a very distinguished career. From 20, um, most recently, he served as the Special Envoy for the Horn of Africa for the Department of State, the U.S. Department of State. Uh, previously, he, had, he was also, for nearly six years, the Undersecretary General for Political Affairs of the United Nations, the most senior American at the U.N., uh, running all political affairs there. And prior to that, a long and distinguished career in the U.S. Foreign Service, including as Ambassador to Lebanon and as Assistant Secretary for Near East Affairs. And last but certainly not least, our vice president and the director of the foreign policy program, Suzanne Maloney, who in her private head is also our Iran expert and a senior fellow in the foreign policy program, of course, in the Center for Middle East Policy. Uh, Suzanne has served both Democratic and Republican administrations on policy and policy planning uh, at the State Department and much else. I'll note that tomorrow she is testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and I uh, encourage everyone to tune into that. Thank you all very much for joining. Uh, we'll get straight into the meat of it. Uh, we have here a network, but we also have a group of parties, actors who have their own calculations. So why don't we do a quick tour around and discuss each one of them, even just the basics. Jeff, you, you were ambassador to Lebanon. You dealt a lot uh, with the issue of Hezbollah. Could you tell us a little, about, a little bit about who they are and what are they doing right now? Uh, sure. Thanks, Natan. Good afternoon, everybody. You know, Hezbollah has been described as a state within a state, or you could say because of how weak Lebanon's institutions are, it's a state within a non-state. Um, and it's also been described as, as the Islamic Republic of Iran's most successful export. And that gets back to the, that gets back to the beginnings of Hezbollah. I think it provides an example of Iran's um, methods in trying to promote proxies and partners and, and proxies and partners throughout the Middle East and beyond. Um, Hezbollah came about during the Lebanese Civil War back in the 1980s. Remember, the Iranian Revolution was 1979. The um, the Iranian leaders, um, the supreme leader, wanted to have wanted to export the revolution, and Lebanon was his venue for for success in trying to do this. Lebanon, of course, is a multi-confessional population: um, Shia Muslims, Sunni Muslims, Christians, Jews, etc. And the Shia community had long-standing ties with Iran already, theological ties, family ties, et cetera. But they were also very much um, the, the underclass inside Lebanon. And Iran was able to exploit the ties in Lebanon between, between the Lebanese Shia and Iran and work in the chaos of Lebanon's civil war to start what was, what was originally basically completely just a terrorist organization, the, the group that blew up the U.S. Embassy twice, that, that demolished the, the Marine Corps barracks, that um, kidnapped foreigners, et cetera, 
and that has evolved over the years into what I would I would argue, and I'll listen to the other experts today, but I would argue is Iran's Iran's strongest partner. It's not simply a proxy at this point, it's a partner with Iran. Um, and it's, it serves Iran's interests not only in, in sort of forward defense for Iran on the, on the, in Lebanon, but also in terms of train the trainers, in terms of providing, providing expertise to the, to the um, NASA groups in, in Yemen, Iraq, and, and, and elsewhere. It is a Lebanese political actor represented in parliament what it, it has managed to build alliances with enough other Lebanese to, to hold the Lebanese system basically hostage to its will, both through legal means, through the way the Lebanese system works, as well as by the, by the threat of arms. But its primary purpose is, is Iranian. Um, the, the weapons that Hezbollah has um, are basically Iran, Iran's defense against Israel, uh, Iran's deterrence against what against against Israel, um, and it's worth noting too that Hezbollah was one of the major factors that saved Bashar al-Assad in Syria. That Hezbollah was one of the groups that su- that, that supported Bashar, um, um, Bashar al-Assad's oppression of the Syrian of the Syrian uprising. And so there's a there's a not only is Hezbollah, a political party in Lebanon, not only does Hezbollah have its weapons aimed at Israel um, for Iran's deterrence, Hezbollah has now acquired, because of the Syrian civil war, basically army-like training, um, which it it didn't have before. It's, of course, a terrorist organization under US US designation. Um, And the one final note, you, you may remember the 2006 war between Israel and Hezbollah. During that 2006 war, Hezbollah was estimated to have something like 14,000 um, projectiles of various types, rockets, missiles, et cetera. Hezbollah is now estimated to have 150,000 to 180,000 um, um, rockets, missiles, et cetera, in its arsenal, most of which are short range, but not all, but not all of which are short range. Um, so they've spent, basically spent 18 years since that 2006 war building up their capacity Getting battle experience inside inside Syria, training other militias in Iraq, um, Yemen, et cetera, and again, being more than simply a proxy for Iran, this is a partner of Iran. Thank you so much, um, Allison. Why don't we turn to you? Could you give us the one on one on one hundred and one on the Houthis? Who are they, and how how do they relate to our crisis today? Yeah, thanks so much, Natan. To say a few uh, words about the group and their background. This is a, a revolutionary and religious revivalist group that formed or coalesced, we should say, about 20 years ago, specifically around anti-American, anti-Israel, frankly, anti-Semitic sentiment. Um, they have exploited the, the instability in Yemen over the course of the past decade or so to substantially increase their control. And at this point, they've really proven themselves as a formidable fighting force that is also capable of highly sophisticated attacks, not just in the Red Sea, as we've been been seeing over the past few months, but for years in Saudi Arabia, as well as UAE. They've also withstood nearly a decade of airstrikes from a Saudi-led coalition, as well as numerous ground offensives backed by, by the Saudis and Emiratis. And in doing so, they've cemented their control over the vast majority of the Yemeni population, over 25 million Yemenis, um, and instituted a, a level of repressive governance that's that's really unprecedented in the country. I think all of these factors are important. Number one, because there's been a bit of a tendency among American analysts for years now to to underestimate the group. Um, and given this uh, their their status, they cannot be easily dislodged, and they are capable of sustaining or even intensifying their their attacks over the medium term. Regarding their relationship, with Iran, there's um, certainly a, a close and growing relationship uh, between the groups. Um, this is something that has its origins. The, the founders of the Houthi movement had a strong affinity for Iranian revolutionary ideology and, and traveled to Iran. Uh, but Iranian support to the group only really picked up with the outbreak of the, the Yemen war in 2015 and has certainly intensified. Um, there's close alignment of Houthi and Iranian interests and Houthi um, or Iranian material support and expertise has certainly been essential for the Houthi 
um, ability to conduct the kinds of attacks that they've conducted in the Red Sea. All that being said, the Houthis um, have pride in their own independence, as well as a, a deep hostility to the principle of foreign intervention. And in part because of this, we've seen the Houthis uh, assert their independence when their interests diverge from Iran's, and, and they will likely continue to do so in the future. I think it's also important to note that there are ideological differences between the Houthis, um, who are Zaydi Shia and the Iranians, that have relevance to um, certainly Iran's role in Yemen, but likely also to a certain degree how both the Houthis and the Iranians see the relationship. So interestingly enough, because um, the Houthi-Iran relationship is, is quite a bit different than the, the Iran-Hezbollah uh, relationship, I, I would agree with with Jeff that they are more of an Iranian partner than, than a pure proxy. And, and that has implications again for how we look at the current crisis and solutions. Regarding the, the Houthi motivations for uh, the Red Sea attacks, I would say that they're, they're threefold um, and also don't uh, have direct linkages necessarily back to Tehran. The first is genuine ideological motivation. Again, this is a revolutionary group. Many of the Houthi leaders do feel a genuine need to take action to protect Palestinians and protest Israeli actions. But second and, and arguably more powerful is the Houthi interest in distracting domestic dissent at a time when the Houthis are facing growing pressure inside the country over their lack of, of basic governance, uh, repression, lack of salaries and, and public services. And this has really come to a head since the April 2022 truce that deprived the Houthis of a good part of their rationale for their, their uh, poor governance in the country, which was that they were defending Yemenis from a foreign foe. So the Red Sea attacks have provided the Houthis with an opportunity not just to distract the population, which is predominantly very pro-Palestinian, but perhaps more importantly, to replace Saudi Arabia as the foreign foe with the much more compelling uh, foreign foe of the United States. And the third would be for the Houthis to assert uh, their regional role. Again, the Houthis are a highly ambitious group. They themselves see themselves as Iran's equal more than their proxy. Um, and the Red Sea attacks finally provide them with an opportunity to assert that role. So numerous motivations here for the Houthi attacks, but the consequences um, for the region they certainly broaden the geographic scope of the current crisis in the Middle East. Um, but um, more broadly, they've also uh, threatened global maritime commerce, which has both specific economic consequences, as well as consequences for the uh, freedom of navigation as an international norm. So we've seen, in particular, disruption of supply chains between Asia and Europe that rely on the Red Sea for about 40% of, of their trade, but also driving up shipping costs more broadly at a time when the economy is still highly vulnerable, um, suffering from inflation, and uh, also vulnerable with just-in-time in supply chains. We've also seen more dramatic consequences in the region, uh, devastating consequences for aid deliveries to Sudan, um, as well as uh, very severe economic consequences for Egypt, a country already facing an economic crisis that relies very heavily on the Suez Canal for revenues. Um, we've seen about a 40% drop in, in those revenues as a result of the attacks. Regarding implications for the freedom of navigation, there's certainly a, a threat that other small, rogue, non-state actors may seek to replicate the Houthi playbook, especially with some of their, their cheaper, more readily available technology like, like drones. Um, I think we've seen relatively positive U.S. results in, in shooting down uh, missiles and UAVs from the U.S. Navy. What has been less positive has been the international community's ability to mobilize a truly unified coalition in the Red Sea to counter these attacks. And I think we've seen instead more of a, a patchwork of different efforts, which which undermines um, that that unity as well as the effectiveness of the campaign. And I think that a number of those those factors driving that that patchwork have little to do with Gaza. And so, is something that the international community is going to have to grapple with if we see future threats of of this nature. I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Allison. Bernard, if I may turn to you, uh, for perhaps the, the least well-defined actor here, people, we often talk about Iran-backed militia, Shia militia in Iraq. Give us a sense of what, what we're really talking about. Uh, how Iranian are they? How organic are they? Who are they? 
Thank you so much, Natan, and thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, to be with you all. Um, I guess when we're talking about the popular mobilization forces, many kind of trace that story back to 2014 um, as ISIS swiftly takes over uh, a third of Iraq and the Iraqi army just falls apart. Uh, a group of different paramilitaries come together um, and different militias come together and, and form what becomes known as the popular mobilization forces, al hajj al-Shaabi. Um, and, 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 and although that is when the name comes about, of course, this brings together several armed groups and networks that have existed for decades. I mean, some going back to the 1980s, the Badr organization and Kitab Hezbollah developed in Iran in the 1980s as, as part of the opposition to the Saddam Hussein regime in Iraq. Um, and others going, you know, back in the 90s and after 2003. So so I think where the conversation, you know, on, on the popular mobilization forces may, may diverge from Hezbollah or the Houthis is the incoherence of, of, of the PMF. And what I mean here is it's very much an umbrella group of, you know, dozens of armed groups that have very different at times ideologies, very different interests, very different capabilities, um, but are to some extent connected. The, pro the, the majority of them are Shia, but of course you also have Christian, you have Yazidi, you have Sunni groups linked to these networks under the PMF. And critically, the PMF becomes a part of the Iraqi state. So it's hard to consider these groups solely as a military organization. Like the other groups, they, they very much have national and local political representatives. They have civil servants across the Iraqi state. They have civil society organizations. They very much become, uh, you know, a, a, Almost, they, they start performing the functions of, of the state as, as, as you know, we, we were discussing these very fragile states. Within the PMF, I think what's important for this conversation is a fundamental debate between the local versus the transnational. So some groups in the PMF, they think Iraq and they think domestic, we want to become powerful actors within the Iraqi state. And currently, they have become quite uh, powerful with the, with the current government of Prime Minister Mohammed Shia Sudani. They are the governing coalition under the Shia coordination framework, or groups like Badr, the Badr organization, but also Asab Ahl al Haq and others. The status quo is working for them, and so the current escalation in the sort of region is 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 risky for them. However, within the PMF, these groups, you also have those that are transnational, those that are vanguard networks, those that aren't necessarily interested in local politics or, or who don't even recognize the borders between Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, these borders that they consider to be constructed by, uh, you know, colonialists in, in, in the early 20th century. They are the ones really on the front line of, of, of the escalation that we see today. They are the ones that make up the Islamic resistance of, of, of Iraq. These are groups like Kitab Hezbollah, uh, Harakat Hezbollah al Jaba, uh, Kitab Sayyid al Shahada. These groups are the ones fighting both in Iraq and in Syria on the front lines in this resistance. And, and, and since October 7th, have been the ones that, that, that have escalated from their perspective in defense of, 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 of Palestine and. and in, in, in the fight against Israel and, and, and the U.S., these are the ones that, that are in conflict with the U.S. So because of that, I think it's 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 quite difficult to try to kind of answer your question in, in just a few minutes, of course, because of how these networks and the umbrella that it is, and also the internal conflicts. So, you know, in, in another sense, the PMF becomes one of the, weak, the, the weakest point or the Achilles heel of the PMF is this internal conflict where you have some that are trying not to, to escalate, whereas others, their goal is to escalate. And so, you know, to, to get back to it, they, they kind of, it, it, it's, it's not black or white. They can be state and they can be non-state. They can be both in the formal and the informal. And I think to sort of go back, they, they are strong allies of Iran. They work very closely with Iran, but of course, many of them also have their own agency. And at times they're able to interpret or to push back on Iran. And it's a constant negotiation based on local transnational interests uh, and, 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 and a, a working policy with, with, with Iran. So maybe I would leave it at that for now. Thank you, fantastic. Um, Suzanne, I'll turn to you. Uh, we know a bit what Iran is, but can you tell us a little bit about how Iran thinks about this network? 
Um, is it an extension, extension of the revolution? Is it a geopolitical calculation? Uh, are these these elements different from the Iranian perspective, Hezbollah versus the Houthis versus uh, the very varied organizations in Iraq that Renat was talking about. Thanks, Natan. And um, thank you for letting me go last in this first round of questioning, because I've just been taking tons of notes uh, from my colleagues here. Um, it's been really a masterclass to hear Jeff and Allison and Renaud talk about uh, the various uh, militias in each local context. Um, from the Iranian point of view, um, this was uh, sort of a natural outgrowth of the revolution. The uh, Islamic revolutionaries in 1979 genuinely believed that this was not a revolution in a single state, that it would expand to encompass the wider Ummah and potentially the entire world. This was a sincere belief on their part. Um, but they also had longstanding connections in various parts of the region with other militant and radical groups. And so there were a number of clerics uh, on the Iranian side who had trained primarily with Palestinian militants in uh, Lebanon, um, and they had familial communal ties, clerical relationships in Lebanon. And so uh, particularly at a time of a lot of violence and chaos uh, within Lebanon, it was not at all surprising to see some of the more radical elements of the Iranian, early Iranian revolutionary state decamp to Lebanon and really you know, set up a, a training camp that uh, brought in Revolutionary Guardsmen and built what we now know to be Hezbollah. And so in that sense, Hezbollah is really, you know, it, it is um, emerged into something well beyond what, what it was at its uh, inception. But Hezbollah was the, the first, the foremost, and remains, I think, very much first among equals in terms of the, the relationship that it has um, with the Iranian state, very organic, but also still um, autonomous and still, uh, you know, sort of a respected peer organization, one that er, the Iranian Quds Force has relied upon over the decades um, in different types of ways. Uh, I would say there are differences in some of the, um, you know, the the different groups and the different settings, and also there's there are differences over time. Um, what's interesting, is, of course, is that you know there was a period of time in which Iran had to compete with other radical actors uh, across the Middle East for patronage of of different militias and groups, whether it was Muammar Gaddafi in Libya or Saddam Hussein in, in uh, Baghdad. There, there were other deep-pocketed dictators who wanted to have um, proxy groups aligned with them. Today, that is um, far less the case. And so, you know, there's a kind of demand push on the Iranian side uh, it, that works in the Iranian favor. And what the Iranians have also been able to do is to um, coalesce groups at different points in time to preserve some of their most important allies and assets. And so, of course, the the most notable story in that respect is um, the way that I I Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps intervened in Syria, pulling together militia fighters from across Shia groups in South Asia, as well as Iraq, and really leaning into the relationship with Hezbollah to help coordinate and to help manage um, these, these fighters. Um, the, Iran also, of course, uh, has relationships with various uh, militia groups in uh, the Palestinian territories. Those are somewhat different in the sense that they don't have the same religious underpin underpinning, and they have, as a result, at times, um, been kept at, at more at arm's length, and particularly by Hamas. And there have been real frictions amongst uh, the groups, uh, particularly over the Syrian civil war. You but when because push they comes are Sunni organizations, as opposed because, to because yeah, because they are Sunni organizations. Um, but I think when, when push comes to shove, and I'll I'll close here. You know, the efficacy of Iran's ability to mobilize these groups to bring um, high-tech weaponry and the means of production for that weaponry to disperse funds, to coordinate, and to train um, has brought a variety of different actors uh, back to Iran um, in a variety of different ways over the years. And it really has made Iran sort of the godfather of, um, of all of these um, different militia groups that are now wreaking havoc across the Middle East. Thanks, Suzanne. I'm going to stay with you for a moment. And, and I'd like to ask you a little bit about the Iranian calculation in this crisis, uh, both to what degree are they involved or not involved in, in October 7th, but also in what follows. And what do you think they are hoping to achieve? What, what do you think their aim in the short term is uh, in, in this horrific crisis we're seeing? 
Well, there is no hard evidence that the Iranians had either foreknowledge or direct involvement in, in the plot that produced the horrific massacres on October 7th. But it's also incontrovertible that Hamas could not have affected these attacks without the direct support and long time funding and training and material equipment uh, by the Iranian regime. And so, you know, it is a key player, whether there was um, deliberate engagement in the run up to the in planning of the attacks themselves. And of course, the Iranians have championed Hamas, uh, championed uh, the resistance and um, in many ways trying to align themselves um, with the actions of October 7th, which they see as the start of a kind of remaking of the broader Middle East. They've kind of, the uh, Iranian leaders have been on record mocking um, some of the various schemes of, of the Biden administration and prior U.S. Ad administrations to um, try to reorder the region in a way that would be uh, uh, better aligned with the West, more conducive to um, Western democracy. The Iranians see what happened on October 7th as the start of a reordering that is very much in their favor. And the the somewhat spontaneous eruption of, um, of militia engagement um, from the Houthis, from Hezbollah, and from the Iraqi Shia militias has helped to reinforce that, that in fact it is Iran that is the, the strongest player, that its um, uh, partisans have come to the fore in a way to try to defend Palestine, and that in effect the, the Palestinian issue is now front and center for both Arab governments and the wider Arab world in a way that it simply hadn't been for many years. Um, what the Iranians are hoping to get out of this, I think, is a reduction in the presence of the United States in the region. Um, this has been a longstanding aim of theirs to evict particularly American troops from the region, but they'd be very happy to see um, American businesses and tourists and, and citizens sidelined as well. Um, they are also convinced that Israel, in the, in the translation of the Persian phrase, will pass from the page of time or the page of history. And so they see the actions that Hamas has undertaken, the divisions within Israel itself that predated the, the, the conflict. And since that time, um, the, uh, the, the real sense that Israel is perhaps shrinking within its own boundaries because uh, of the attacks from Hezbollah in the north that have forced many Israelis to flee their home. And of course, the horrific attacks uh, by Hamas in the south. So for Iran, um, there's a sense of triumphalism, um, but also I think a sense of wariness. They have been very careful to avoid uh, anything that would put them directly in the crosshairs of the US military. And as uh, the US had began to respond to some of the attacks that we've seen over the course of the past four and a half months from various militia groups, Iran appears to have counseled uh, some of its closest partisans to stand down and to avoid provocation. Thanks so much. Renad, I'm going to turn back to you and maybe snake back in the order. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the immediate calculations right now, operations, especially against American forces and the American response? Um, how do you see the calculation going forward? What is the Iranian thinking here, but also what is the thinking of the main combatant groups uh, among Iraqis? Sure. So I think um, there's been a calculation that um, Iraq... Uh, and Syria have to be the main playgrounds for 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 this conflict that neither Iran nor Lebanon to 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 an extent as well is where these you know this axis of resistance wants to be doing 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 much of the fighting but that these resistance groups that operate you know that move back and forth across the borders of Iraq and Syria are going to be the ones on the front line of of, of this response um and 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 a response to you know their their response to an opposition to Israel and 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 the war in in Gaza so Within that, I think there is still this equilibrium of violence. Um, and, and, and what I mean by that is that, that, that these groups, they're not looking necessarily for a direct war with either Israel or the US, a direct confrontation they know is not in their interests. Um, they play a different game. Um, and so, but this is very uh, sort of destabilizing and very uh, risky. And you see, for example, Kitab Hezbollah, one of these groups, killed three U.S. Uh, service members 
um, at the end of January in, in, in Tower 22 on the border of, of Jordan and, and Syria, invoking a, a, a big response. The last time an American service person was directly killed was at the end of 2019. So the intention isn't necessarily to invo invoke a big regional war from their perspective, but it is to be showcasing some kind of response. So if from, not just from the, their perspective, but the perspective of the wider axis, because they they have been chosen as the, the 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 foot soldiers almost on the front line fighting in in, in primarily in Iraq and Syria, um, and and so I would say that that is the kind of calculation that that they're pursuing. Um, we see at the moment that you know the U.S. response from the Biden administration has led to some kind of deterrence that seems to be intact at the moment. That um, you know, Kitab Hezbollah seems to still be on, holding on to what ceasefire it has. Um, but as as I say, that equilibrium of violence, which was shaken massively after October seventh, has led to a very precarious region where a a a, a something that goes wrong, a misfire, or some you know, a, a cer certainly casualties. Could lead to 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 further escalation, but I think that's what we've seen. And keep in mind that this this conflict um, did not begin necessarily in, on October seventh. And after October seventh, this has been a wider regional struggle between the U.S. and, of course, these axis of resistance groups in the region for for several years now, um, going back to 2019, 2020. Uh, and 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 is part of I think you know from from their calculation trying to present themselves ideologically as being on the front line of a fight against what they see as U.S. imperialism and all of this language that 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 they use in their resistance. Thanks so much. Uh, we're going to get uh, very soon to American policy, of course. Um, but Allison, I'd like to ask you sort of in a similar vein about the Houthis. You described a little bit their calculations and their desire to um, divert attention, perhaps from domestic uh, interests. Can you describe a little bit where they stand today? Obviously, they've met a quite remarkable response, a quite remarkable response in the United States, but also others with direct attacks um, on Houthi positions in Yemen. Uh, how effective is this and how much does this really affect their calculation? And if I may, given your vast experience in this, what does this say also for the Yemeni truce? After all, we're describing uh, horrific conditions right now, but let's, let's just not forget uh, we're coming off years of absolutely horrific civil war in Yemen that eclipsed, in fact, what we're seeing right now so far. Thanks, Natan. I'll, I'll start with your second question. Um, Yemen itself is, is in a very transitional phase. So since the April uh, 2022 truce, the country transitioned from a situation of pretty high intensity civil and regional conflict to a situation of, of tenuous talks around a political transition. And this transitional phase, which many Yemenis call no war, no peace, is something that the Houthis have, have said publicly that they do not like, and it is um, objectively not an economically sustainable situation for the Houthis. This is a, a group that controls the vast majority of the population, but has no access to the country's major natural resources, particularly oil and gas, and in the absence of uh, internationally backed political resolution, they also don't have full control over the, the major port and airport in, in the country. So there are a few different paths the Houthis might take to try to get out of this, this transitional phase. First, they, they could decide to go forward with, with the UN-backed political talks around a, a transition. Um, this would gradually provide them access to significant new economic resources and likely eventually cement their control. But to do so, they would need to either con convince the UN Security Council to accept a certain threshold of uh, continued attack attacks or moderate their behavior and, and, and cease the attacks, which as we've discussed, they have a few different reasons not, not to do that. So that may lead them to pursue um, some combination of the second two scenarios, one in which they seek a side deal with the Saudis and, and potentially also the Emiratis, whereby they seek to get uh, increasing concessions from the Saudis uh, access to economic resources, potentially even greater access to uh, oil and gas resources in the country. This option would be uh, uh, highly abhorrent to the anti-Houthi groups in the country, including the internationally recognized Yemen government. But the Gulf countries could feel compelled to, to force something like this through 
in order to avoid renewed Houthi attacks on their territory, which would be particularly devastating in the current environment. And the third option that the Houthis could pursue um, is renewed offensives in strategic territory in Yemen, particularly the oil and gas rich provinces. This is something that the Houthis uh, tried for years and failed to do, but they may hope that uh, the renewed momentum from the, the popular support for their attacks in the Red Sea, combined with perhaps a hesitancy from the Saudis and the Emiratis to come into the defense of, of their Yemeni partners, particularly with, with close air support, again, out of that interest in avoiding renewed Houthi attacks on their territory, that it could change the battle dynamics on the ground. Um, needless to say, the second and third scenarios would result in considerable instability in Yemen, which just makes the, the likelihood of a renewed and, and persistent threat to freedom of navigation much more likely. Um, it would cement Yemen's status as, as a failed state by depriving it of the international support and uh, political stability necessary for an economic recovery. And perhaps most importantly, it would uh, leave very few constraints or international leverage over the Houthi, over the Houthis over the medium term to, to help moderate their behavior. So in both of those scenarios, I think we could see a persistent threat to freedom of navigation and, and potentially long-term uh, adjustments in, in global commerce as, as a result. So I think those are, are all factors um, that we certainly need to grapple with going forward. Do you, do you expect that this would continue if there is a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas in the, in the coming days, which is potential, or potentially happening before Ramadan, or if the war there winds down in the coming weeks or months, would the Houthi position now continue? Is this a weapon that that is just too valuable to give up? Um. I think so. There seems to be a wide consensus among Yemen experts that this is the case. And it really just goes back to the fact that the Houthi motivations for the attacks are only in part due to the situation in Gaza. So they may couch future attacks in the context of Gaza, calling for additional humanitarian aid or stronger uh, commitments on a Palestinian state. I think even if we do get the ceasefire agreement, it's it's certainly not going to be a, a comprehensive um uh, lasting solution, peace, peace solution in, in Gaza. So Houthis would certainly have plenty of, of reasons to continue that, that justification. We did see them continue attacks during the last uh, humanitarian ceasefire in, in Gaza in, in November. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the continued motivation for the Houthis for these attacks would, would likely be distracting their domestic population um, or seeking even concessions from the international community. Thanks so much. Jeff, straight from the beginning, right after October 7th, uh, the administration, in fact, the president himself spoke about uh, the possibility of escalation, and he was referring most prominently to Hezbollah. Uh, by many reports on October 11th, uh, is, Israelis were con contemplating uh, some kind of preemptive, or not quite preemptive, but strike in uh, Lebanon, uh, preempting what they thought would be a larger scale conflict with Hezbollah. Right now, we see negotiations, Americans heavily involved in that, French and others. First, could you tell us a little bit what's at stake? What, what are the terms of these negotiations? But secondly, are we out of the woods? Is a, a wider conflict between Israel and Hezbollah beyond the war that we are already seeing? Of course, there are, there are many deaths in this war already between the two sides. Is that still in the cards? I mean, Hezbollah is playing a very dangerous game here. I don't think Hezbollah wants a full-scale war with Israel, but it could happen. We're not out of the woods yet, um, in, in, you know, in, in my view. But it's, interest, it's interesting to listen to my fellow pa panelists and to think about the contrast between the Houthis' um, domestic calculations and Hezbollah's domestic calculations. Whereas, as Alice is explaining, the Houthis' domestic credibility increases with their, with their attacks on the Red Sea, whereas Hezbollah's acts as a resistance participation, and Hezbollah's role as a domestic player are at odds, their attention. The Lebanese do not want war in general. Um, and what Hezbollah is doing could very easily trip Lebanon into war. And so I think that, that when you look at, when you, when you read Hassan Nasrallah's speeches, listen to Hassan Nasrallah's speeches, when you look at what Hezbollah is doing, Hezbollah is trying to find a way to have its cake and eat it too where they can show that they are part of the axis of resistance by firing into northern Israel at, at, a, at a fairly regular clip, four or five a day, et, et cetera. Um, and, and Israel, of course, is firing mostly into, into southern Lebanon. And this has so far been manageable. 
But there are 80,000 Israelis estimated who can't go home. A similar number on the Lebanese side who fled, who fled their houses on the, fled their houses um, in, in southern Lebanon under the Israeli um, retaliatory um, strikes. At some point, does this become intolerable for Israel? Does Israel be the actor that brings the Lebanon into full-scale war because it's intolerable for the Israelis to watch as 80,000 people can't go home? Most of Hezbollah's weapons, as I, under, as I understand it, are fairly, are fairly um, have a fairly limited range. Not all, there's some long range, guided missiles and rockets that Hezbollah has in its arsenal now, but the bulk of its arsenal are short range. So what the, what the US and French, um, negotiators are trying to do is find a formula by which Hezbollah pulls back from the border at a sufficient distance, numbers like 10 kilometers, et cetera, being used, um, that would provide the Israelis with, with, a, with a sense of security, that you're not going to have an October 7th type incursion, that these short range uh, munitions that Hezbollah has will be beyond their ability to fire into northern Israel to allow the Israelis, the Israelis to go home. But it really is interesting to see how Hezbollah's d domestic role, and you know, it's the strongest political party inside Lebanon, I think is a, is, is a um, instrument of restraint on Hezbollah's firing into Israel because the Lebanese do not want war. They remember very well what happened in 2006 um, when Hezbollah abducted a, couple, abducted a couple soldiers inside Israel, killed killed others inside Israel, and that launched the 2006 war. And this war would be far, far more devastating. And Lebanon is in worse shape, worse shape economically than it was in 2006. So Hezbollah has to balance its um, desire to be seen as the revolutionary member of the axis of resistance, but not go so far as to trip Lebanon into war. And there could be easily be miscalculations or the Israelis could, could decide that the situation is simply intolerable and take action on their own. We've seen the Israelis now have fired farther north. They fired into the Bekaa Valley, 60, 60 miles north of the, of the Lebanese-Israel border yesterday, um, and 30 miles north the previous day. So Israel is is pushing a bit. Um, and and I I think that the, the risks of, of war, a full-scale war between Israel and Lebanon remain real. Thank you. Before we turn to American foreign policy in this regard, Renat, could I, could I go back to you and just ask, in this very interesting dynamic that we see, Houthis gaining domestically because of their participation, at least in public opinion, uh, and maybe diversion from other issues, whereas Hezbollah playing with fire domestically given 2006 and the memory of that, where do the different groups uh, in Iraq, obviously not uniformly, where do they stand in this regard? Do they gain from this? Do they uh, risk being seen as a pawn of Iran, which we should remember fought Iraq for many long, bloody years? How does it stand for them? Yeah, well, crucially, these groups have been facing their own legitimacy gap inside Iraq for, for many years. There have been protests uh, by, by Iraqis across the country, but particularly in the south, where the social base of these groups is, is, is strongest, uh, protesting against these groups, protesting against the Iraqi political system, and also protesting against Iran. Um, so so they have this legitimacy gap, um, and they've lost a lot of ideological credibility and authority, and they're hoping you know, as 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 the, you know, the Houthis are and others that that being on the front line in the fight against Israel and and saying we're doing something that Gulf countries aren't doing, we're really on the front line here, can try and recover some of that gap. Because of course, while many Iraqis are sort of against this sort of these groups and and and, and the corruption and and Iran, they're also. Pro, you know, they're also with Palestinians here. They're very much sort of horrified by what they see, uh, you know, in, in, in the war on between Israel and, and, and Palestine. So these groups are trying that. And thus far, really, I think Iraqis are still saying, OK, that's fine. But we've seen this done before. Right. Saddam Hussein used to do this. I mean, it, it's very common for, for these leaders in this country to be that champion of, of, of a cause, but that doesn't really bring, you know, the food to or, or, or basic services. And, and that's really what many of the Iraqis are still calling for. So let's say, yes, the issue is being instrumentalized, but it's not being kind of bought by many. Suzanne, I'll, I'll turn to you, uh, just start us off on the question of, um, of American policy in this regard. A common argument you can hear in Washington is that to a degree, not a full degree, this crisis is a crisis between the U.S. and Israel, perhaps on one side, and Iran and a network on the other. Uh, 
and that Iran here is fighting to the last Palestinian, the last Lebanese, the last Yemeni, the last Iraqi, hopefully not the last of any of them, um, but that America should take the fight to Iran itself. This is a, I'm caricaturizing, of course, this is, this is a broad sweep and perhaps an unfair characterization of this argument, but that America should be much tougher with Iran itself, perhaps that Israel should be much tougher with Iran itself as opposed to its proxies. How do you think the American administration has been thinking about this and how do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, it's been a very interesting debate. And obviously, Iran um, from, you know, October 7th onward is kind of loom large in how the US responded to the crisis, because it was clear from the outset that Tehran would would seek to exploit um, this moment and to its own advantage. Um, I think the administration largely has has got the formula right since October 7th with respect to the Iranians, um, because, you know, pushing back and punching back against Tehran doesn't just, you know, sort of end with that. It will have fallout in all those areas, all those countries that we've talked about and, and others as well, in which Iran has influence or access. Um, those are countries where the United States would not like to see, um, you know, internal chaos um, or political uh, meltdowns become even worse. They would like the truce to hold in in Yemen. They would like to avoid um, an even worse uh, devolution of state authority in Lebanon. They would like to preserve uh, some stability in Iraq, if possible. And so American reprisals um, that might be, that, that might in fact generate a higher tempo of militia activity around the region are, are one of the things that I think the that you know the administration was hoping to avoid. At the same time, they couldn't simply sit on their hands, particularly not after several Americans were killed um, in a drone attack uh, in a small base on the Jordanian border. And uh, you know what we've seen is a series of reprisals um, that really did begin in late October um, against individual groups. Many of them appeared to be, um, you know, sort of timed in a way um, and targeted in a way that wasn't uh, likely to bring us up the ladder of escalation in, in the sense that, you know, uh, empty buildings were hit. Um, I, I don't think there was much risk of actually hitting any Revolutionary Guard in some of the early strikes. But, you know, we've seen um, the administration get much more serious. Um, and there were 85 strikes, I believe, uh, on February 3rd. And, you know, the, the tempo of, of regularity, um, I think, now is established in a way. And as we've seen, um, at least the Iraqi Shia militias have suggested that after about 160 or 170 um, attacks on, on U.S. forces, that they are now perhaps standing down. Um, I think the administration has also uh, done a passable job in trying to manage the crisis in the Red Sea. I will leave that to Allison, um, but I think you know that's a different kind of a challenge in effect, um, and one for which I think, as she suggested, we're going to have to be dealing for quite a long time. I think the idea of of trying to strike at Iran directly, to strike Iranian territory or strike uh, Iranian positions in the Persian Gulf, um, would be um, absolutely a, a disaster because it would take us on the road to a, an all-out war involving Iran at a time where we're already managing um, a, a pretty bloody crisis in the Middle East, as well as uh, a war in Europe and, and the challenge of China. And I don't think that there's really any strong case to take the war to Iranian territory at this time. And, um, you know, I think the administration has gotten that right. Thank you. It, it'll be interesting to see, of course, that version also between Israeli and American positions on this. Israelis seem to be far more hawkish on this question. But Allison, that's a great segue to you. Um, the U.S. and its allies have tried to put together a coalition to deal with this issue in the Red Sea, both in the instance of the Red Sea, but also, as you said in the beginning, as a, an instance of a broader question of, of freedom of navigation. Um, it's not been easy, to say the least. How, how would you assess it? And as one of the questions we got in, which are very helpful, thank you for everyone sending them in, is there, are, is there a maritime capacity the United States is, is lacking? Is there something else that it would need in terms of actual capacity to, uh, to stop these attacks? Again, as I think um, we've seen with the U.S. Navy's ability to shoot down the missiles and, and UAVs, and, and now we're seeing new Houthi capabilities with USVs and, and U, uh, underwater uh, unmanned vehicles. Uh, it's the the problem has been in actually getting the broader international community to come together to protect this this essentially global good. 
So there are, the reasons for that are, are numerous. Obviously, great power competition, not something that's going to be resolved anytime soon. That's why China, despite their considerable equities, have not been seriously engaged in maritime efforts in the Red Sea. Um, certainly political sensitivities over Gaza, why you have not seen Middle Eastern partners more engaged. But also, I, I think there's um, you know, legal complexities and political sensitivities uh, from even U.S. allies in, in Europe. And, and there are numerous considerations uh, driving those. But, but there is a, this broader trend of anti-internationalism that I think does complicate a truly unified international response to these, these threats to, to global goods. Regarding um, more specific U.S. actions in Yemen, we've seen the targeted U.S. and U.K. strikes as well as continued maritime weapons interdictions to try to blunt Houthi capabilities to conduct these attacks. Um, both of those measures certainly impose costs on the Houthis, but they cannot completely degrade Houthi capabilities. I think that's something that everyone recognizes. These weapons are just too mobile. The Houthis are too resilient. Again, they've already withstood a decade, uh, nearly a decade of Saudi airstrikes. Um, We've also seen the U.S. deploy the specially designated global terrorist designation. This was announced last month, took effect about a week and a half ago. This could marginally increase the Houthi sense of urgency, specifically economic urgency, to reach some sort of agreement. That being said, the Houthis do not depend heavily on licit international financial networks, and, and so the impact of, of any such designation like that will, will be limited. I would argue that we need to be focused on leveraging all of these tools in concert, specifically towards the goal of reaching a negotiated solution focused on Yemen that is connected to the political process. Again, pushing the Houthis towards that first scenario that I laid out that leverages uh, the most significant leverage that the, the international community has with the Houthis um, and provides the most kind of durable um, uh, solution to instability in the country. That agreement would also likely need to be connected to some sort of progress on regional de-escalation, whether it's a, a ceasefire or some other measure um, because of the Houthis' ideological motiva motivations, because of their need to demonstrate publicly that their actions have had a benefit for Palestinians. I think that this is a, a necessary but not sufficient criteria. And third, the international community really needs to clearly define and uphold clear lines for what they consider unacceptable Houthi behavior. Um, this is something that um, we struggled to do in, in the past, um, and the Houthis will, will very quickly seek to, to leverage any disunity between the international community to push negotiations towards a situation of appeasement. This is something they've perfected um, in, in recent years, perhaps learning from Iran in that regard, um, but uh, it, I think it can be countered, but it is, it is quite difficult. I think Yemen is, is a good example, looking at all of these crises of where these are very distinct local challenges that, that the international community is, is facing that require uh, specific targeted local solutions, while also recognizing the linkages between the group. Again, why we were a bit caught, caught off guard, frankly, when the Houthis entered this, this regional conflict. We just have to avoid the tendency to, to see all of these uh, various groups through a single lens or to seek a, a single solution for all of them. Great, we're not um, following just on that theme. Of course, American policy in Iraq is multifaceted and complex and extremely important um, uh, given the American role in the country. Can you describe a little bit the American policy both with regard to military threats, we've seen uh, strikes by America, but the broader context of American policy and American standing in Iraq today, uh, given public opinion in the broader context in general? Sure. I think, um, you know, the U.S. has faced uh, a, a policy conundrum um, when it comes to coherence in Iraq, you know, 20, 21 years since um, the U.S.-led invasion. And, and, and that is, there are many policies at its disposal. At its disposal. Uh, the U.S. has, you know, struck militarily, has killed the senior leaders of these armed groups, um, including Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mehdi Mohandas. The U.S. has sanctioned their banks and their businesses. Uh, the U.S. has struck their weapons depots. The U.S. has hit their trading hubs along the borders between Iraq and Syria. And yet these policies don't seem to be really either altering the behavior of these groups or weakening them, in fact. Um, and, and oftentimes these groups are stronger after that. And I think this all comes down to um, what these groups represent. And, you know, it comes back to the, that question of a network. 
I had an American, uh, you know, official once describe a group like Kitab Hezbollah, the re the resistance group that killed the three American service people uh, last month in in Jordan, as a cancerous tumor that needs to re be removed. Right. And so if you think about these different policies that we've seen, that's what it's been. It's about how we can just simply kinetically often remove this. But that doesn't take into account what these groups actually are and what they represent and how they are very much part of an ecosystem. And so that has to be the conversation. How do we you know what what are the reasons why these groups rise up? What is it about these ecosystems, the fragility in these states, the incoherence in the state society relations across this region that give the space for these types of groups to rise? And that's the I think I think it's a much more difficult question, but it has to be the, the conversation being had to create that coherence. And, and very briefly, you know, it, it's, it's very clear that, that, that both the Biden administration right now, but also the Iraqi government and its governing coalition want the same thing, which is to move towards what they're calling a new relationship between the two countries, which is what they're calling a normalized bilateral relations, right? So right now you have U.S. troops in Iraq, which are there as part of the anti-ISIS uh, coalition. Both sides are now desperately, but still trying to choreograph what a new relationship will look like. The post-October 7th context has created, has, has to some extent risked or destabilized these negotiations, but they're nonetheless still continuing to try and negotiate, trying to understand what the U.S.-Iraq relationship looks like. And I think something important to note that even at those in Iraq who, let's say, are closest to Iran or that are most anti-U.S., do not want Iraq to turn into a pariah state that's sanctioned like Iran or that's isolated like Iran. They benefit from Iraq, Iraq's access to international markets, to the region. And so it's, it's very much a question of what that relationship between the U.S. and Iraq will look like after the kind of fight on ISIS, which has represented the current relationship, uh, moves forward. Thanks so much, Renat. Uh, Jeff, we're going to f finish with you, and I'd like to ask you both any any similar thoughts on Lebanon, but in particular, taking your previous hats also as Assistant Secretary for Near East Affairs and Ambassador to Lebanon, on the American policy uh, more broadly. Could you describe a little bit the life of the Middle East hand of this administration? The administration started out thinking it was finally pivoting to Asia, and it did to a large degree, to great power competition, not only in Asia. Um, what are the considerations for the American officials involved, what does the juggling act look like day to day? What kind of considerations are going into that life? Commiserate a little bit for Assistant Secretary Barbara Leaf, in other words. Um, well, obviously, uh, when you're working in the Middle East, like other parts of the world, particularly the Middle East, you have to be prepared for the unexpected. No one no one expected October 7th, including, including you know, Israeli Prime Minister, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. In fact, those of us that were very concerned about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict at the time were very much focused on the West Bank, on the rising tensions in the in the West Bank, um, under the with the um, Israeli increased violence in Israeli settlers, etc. So you have to always be prepared for the for the unexpected. And I, and listening to my fellow panelists and, the, and 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 for those comments about the ecosystem, I think that one thing that that we need to keep in mind is on Iran is that Iran has proven very able to work in chaos. Hezbollah's roots are in the Lebanese civil war. You have these Iraqi, these Iranian allied Iraqi, um, Iraqi militias that that arise during the chaos after the after the civil war, after the U.S. led invasion of Iraq. The Yemen, you have the same thing where you had the Iranian involvement was deepened during the Yemeni civil wars. Syria, the same thing. The Iranian connections with Syria are much deeper now. So we have to keep in mind if we're working in the Middle East, that some place where there's chaos, where there's ungoverned space, is going to likely be a place where Iran can try to do inroads. Um, obviously, the, the Shia theology doesn't um, translate to all parts of the Middle East, but as the relationship of Hamas, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the two, the two um, Iranian allied Palestinian groups show, it, Iran has been able to transcend that Sunni Shia divide as well. So I would, if I were, in, in NEA right now, if I were back in the Near East Affairs Bureau of the State Department right now, I would also want to be talking to my Africa Bureau colleagues about Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, because the other side of the Red Sea is chaotic right now with, Sud with Sudan's civil war. And bad actors like Iran 
can take advantage of chaos, as we've seen in talking about all these um, Iranian proxies and partners in the Middle East. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Dr. Renan Mansour. Thank you to Alison Minor, my colleague here. Thank you to Ambassador Jeffrey Feltman and to Dr. Suzanne Maloney, our Vice President for Foreign Policy. Thank you to everyone for listening in. Uh, please do stay tuned at brookings.edu for a lot of different content a lot of on a lot of different uh, um, aspects of the crisis we're seeing now, including in the Horn of Africa that uh, Jeff just mentioned. Um, uh, wishing you all a, a peaceful night uh, and uh, looking forward to the next event uh, coming up soon. Thank you all very much.